I get it. Nobody likes dark matter. And it's true. And this is coming from a guy who wrote his first paper about dark matter back in 2008. And this is coming from a guy who thinks that dark matter is probably the best answer we have to solve a bunch of cosmological riddles, and yet also admits that there are some serious weaknesses with the dark matter hypothesis. But the reason that dark matter this idea that there is a component of our universe that is invisible to light and does not interact with anything else. The reason that this hypothesis has stuck on for decades is because it's the best answer we have. Seriously, all the alternatives to dark matter are bad. Really bad. Really bad. They don't work as well as dark matter. And yeah, you may not like dark matter and that's fine but I challenge you to come up with a better idea. So let's rewind. The first person to find any hint that dark matter or something like dark matter or something that may be amiss in our universe uh, was the astronomer Fritz Zwicky, who really knew how to rock a bolo tie, but that's a different episode. He was studying back in the 1930s the Coma Cluster of Galaxies, uh, the nearest cluster of galaxies to us. It's a pretty awesome place. It's like a thousand galaxies. He was looking at the motions of galaxies in that cluster and looking at the speeds of those galaxies. And he realized that they were moving too quickly. If you add up all the mutual gravity of all the galaxies, this sets a maximum speed that the galaxies can travel at. Otherwise, the cluster would just dissolve and the galaxies would fling themselves away from each other. And when you look at the gravity of those galaxies and then the actual speed, the speed was many, many times faster than what the maximum speed should be for the coma cluster to literally exist. So he's the one who gave us the name dark matter. He wrote a paper on it and pretty much everyone ignored it after that. We just put it aside. We had no clue what was going on. We had bigger fish to fry. And so that was it. It wasn't until the 1970s and another great astronomer, Vera Rubin, who really awakened, reawakened our understanding of dark matter when she found, uh, again, looking at velocities, the motions of stars inside of galaxies, the stars themselves were moving much too quickly given the amount of gravity, the amount of stuff that was visible inside of a galaxy. The galaxies she was studying should have flung themselves apart billions of years ago. And so there was something, some hidden component holding on to them. Uh, since then, we've come up with a lot more pieces of evidence for the existence of dark matter. So for example, gravitational lensing. If you look at a massive cluster of galaxies and you look at the way that background light gets bent and warped around that cluster and you use Einstein's general theory of relativity to calculate how much mass must be in the cluster in order to create that amount of lensing, you find not enough stuff. There's extra mass in there that you have to put in there to account for all the gravitational lensing. Uh, we can push this back further. We can look at the cosmic microwave background, the afterglow light that was generated when our universe was only 380,000 years old. You can look at the statistics and properties of that background light pattern, and you can run two comparisons, one where there's no dark matter, no invisible component to the universe, and then one where there is, and the one where there is matches the observations that we have. There's no way to match our observations of the cosmic microwave background if you don't include some form of dark matter. And the same goes for the overall structure formation in our universe. Over billions of years, our universe has grown up to build galaxies and groups and clusters in this giant cosmic web. The only way to get the cosmic web with the statistical properties that we actually observe is by including some component that is invisible, that does not interact with light and doesn't interact with anything else. There are also many, many other smaller experiments and observations that lead us to this conclusion of dark matter. Based on all the available evidence, dark matter, a unknown form of particle that we don't know of yet, that does not interact with light or anything else is the best way we can explain all these observations. 
That said, this hypothesis that there is a new component to our universe, that there is a new form of matter that we didn't know about before, it does have its weaknesses. And its primary weaknesses rest inside of galaxies, uh, inside of the smallest scales where we start to notice the effects of dark matter. Like we don't notice the effects of dark matter in our solar system or in our neighborhood of the galaxy. You have to go to galaxy scales and up in order to see this evidence. And dark matter has the hardest time matching observations. Yes, dark matter does reproduce rotation curves inside of galaxies. If you just fill up with a, a galaxy with dark matter and say like 80% of it is hidden, um, then you're able to account for the motions of stars. But there are a couple weaknesses. For example, there's something called the core cusp problem. In our simulations of how galaxies form, when you include dark matter, the dark matter tends to clump up at the center into incredibly high densities. And yes, the cores of galaxies are very dense places, but they're not as dense as the simulations of dark matter suggest that they should be. So this is a difference between having a core in the, in the center of a galaxy or a cusp where the density levels off. Another problem or a potential weakness of dark matter is called the missing satellites problem. Again, simulations of structure formation and how galaxies form when we include dark matter tell us that something like the Milky Way should have many, many, many more small satellites than what we actually observe. Uh, initial estimates were uh, from simulations were telling us that we should have 10 or 20 times the number of satellites than we are actually observing in the Milky Way. It ought to be here, but it isn't. Now these two problems have a couple responses. One response is, Okay, dark matter is a bad idea. There isn't this hidden invisible component, massive particle in our universe. It's just a bad idea. And these pieces of evidence are telling us that dark matter is a bad idea. Another response is that galaxies are complicated and they include a lot of normal matter and that the interactions of that normal matter can influence what we observe. So for example, with the missing satellites problem, once we started doing more sophisticated simulations where it wasn't just dark matter building galaxies, but also normal matter and then star formation rate and the efficiency of stars and all that, we found that as our simulations got more advanced, the number of predicted satellites around something like the Milky Way galaxy went down and down. And then on the other side, as we were doing more observations, we were getting better and better at observing small, super dim, very difficult to see satellites. And so the number of satellites we've been observing has been going up. There is still a discrepancy, but it's not 10 or 20 to one. It's something like two to one, which in astronomy is Basically, you nailed it, but that's, that's again a different episode. And same with the core cusp problem. Maybe there's more interesting physics happening in the core of a galaxy that smooth out the dark matter so it doesn't run into this issue. However, leaving all that aside, the biggest problem with the dark matter hypothesis is that we haven't seen any dark matter. All of our evidence for dark matter is circumstantial, and it's strong circumstantial evidence. We see all these clues for its existence, but we haven't identified the particle. We haven't directly seen it in an experiment or a laboratory here on Earth. We haven't seen indirect observations of it, of it occasionally interacting with itself somewhere and giving off a flash of light. We have no hard direct evidence for the identity of that dark matter particle. And this is a problem for the dark matter hypothesis. This is where alternatives have some room to explore. And the biggest alternative to dark matter belongs to uh, not one particular theory, but a family of theories known as MOND, or Modified Newtonian Dynamics. And the origins of MOND go back to the 1970s with Vera Rubin's original observations of galaxy rotation curves. When you're given that problem of galaxy rotation curves, how do stars m do their orbits around the centers of galaxies so quickly you have two possible responses. Actually three. One is uh, the data are junk, but 
No, Vera Rubin's observations were fantastic. So that's out. So you're left with two options. One, there is a hidden component of matter in our universe that we have never seen before. That line of thinking ends with dark matter. The alternative is maybe we're misunderstanding the physics of gravity at very large scales. And that line of thinking gets you to something called MOND or Modified Newtonian Dynamics and then its outgrowths that have come over the past few decades. MOND has a great tradition in physics. We have rewritten and updated our laws of physics before. We have updated our understanding of gravity before. Newton's gravity gave us really great results here on the Earth and in the solar system had some issues with like Mercury and all that. Einstein's general theory of relativity was an improvement on that once we reached out to these larger scales. So it's perfectly possible the, the universe is under no obligation to have general relativity be universally accepted uh, throughout the entire cosmos at all scales. So maybe once you simply get big enough, once you get up to galaxy scales, what we understand as our laws of gravity and our theories of gravity and our understanding of gravity simply falls apart. So the original version of MOND just looked at basic Newtonian dynamics. So we're skipping general relativity for now and just says like, hey, you know, F equals MA, a gravitational force law, one over R squared, all your normal high school level Newtonian gravity stuff, maybe there's different responses between mass and acceleration at large scales. Maybe once you get out to a certain distance, new, what we understand as Newtonian gravity simply falls apart and it has to be replaced with something else. This isn't that radical of a suggestion. It's not that bad of an idea. Now, Mond does explain the rotation curves of galaxies because it was explicitly designed to explain the rotation curves of galaxies. So that's not quite a prediction, it's a postdiction, just like dark matter. We're presented with a problem. MOND is a potential answer to that. So MOND, especially the original classic MOND, which was just modifying Newton's force laws at large distances, is great at rotation curves. Curveball drops the hammer. There's more to the dark matter story than just rotation curves. There's the original coma cluster results from Fritz Wicke and then follow-up observations that we've made in the decades since. Dark matter has a great time explaining the behaviors of clusters because if you just say, well, there's more mass in the universe, there's more stuff. Galaxies are like little balls of dark matter and clusters are big balls of dark matter. Once you have a big ball of dark matter, you can explain those galaxy motions easy peasy. Mond has a much more difficult time. It's not impossible, it's not impossible. But what happens, especially with the traditional Mond theories, is that once you take it out of a galaxy context and put it in a galaxy cluster, you're able to explain some of the motions of the galaxies because now there is a new force law at work, but it still falls short and you still have a need for the existence of an invisible component of mass in our universe, which doesn't make it wrong, it just makes the argument a little bit less compelling if your alternative to dark matter still requires dark matter. To go beyond galaxy clusters, MOND isn't gonna cut it because MOND, Modified Newtonian Dynamics, is not a complete theory of physics. If you want to write down a theory of physics, you have to make it compatible with all our other theories of physics. You know, if you take the spark plugs out of the engine of a car, you can't just put like a, a live chicken or a block of cheddar in and expect the engine to run. You need to put something in that obeys all the requirements that we need for spark plugs. So MON in particular is not compatible with special relativity. Now you might say maybe special relativity is wrong. Okay, fine. Good luck with that. As far as we know, special relativity is correct. We know that conservation laws 
appear to be correct. We know that symmetry laws appear to be correct. So you need to write a fully fleshed out version of MOND that uh, takes into account symmetry and conservation laws and is compatible with special relativity. When you do that, you get something called Tevis. And this is short for tensor vector scalar theory. I am not going to get into the nuts and bolts of it, but essentially what MOND is to Newtonian physics is what Tevis is to general relativity. So any situation where you have general relativity and apply the gra understanding of gravity that you get from general relativity, you can use Tevis in its place. So this comes about when we're looking at the cosmic microwave background the formation of structures, the, the merging of galaxy clusters, like all these big complicated scenarios with gravitational lensing or, or evolution of the entire universe. You need Tevis instead of Mond, and, and Tevis doesn't work. When you extend modified Newtonian dynamics so that it can attempt to explain the cosmic microwave background, you can't explain the cosmic microwave background. When you're presented with something called uh, the Bullock Cluster, these are two merging clusters of galaxies where the gas is all tingled up in the center, then the galaxies are all out here because the populations of galaxies just swung by each other, and then you use gravitational lensing to figure out where all the mass is. In the dark matter paradigm, the mass should pass through each other because dark matter doesn't care about dark matter. And so it's out here. That's what the lensing provides. When you try to apply Tevis to that scenario or Mond to that scenario, you have a much, much more difficult time matching those observations. You need a very, very specific case. And we've had more than the Bullock Cluster. That is not our only example of merging clusters where dark matter is able to explain it just fine. Tevis and Mond fall short. Cosmic microwave background, dark matter explains it just fine. Tevis and Mond don't. The evolution of structure in our universe, dark matter does just fine. Tevis and Mond don't. So even though Mond is better at galaxy scale, capturing galaxy scale physics, it's worse than dark matter in every other respect. I'm not saying that Tevis or Mond or any of the family of theories that belong to the idea of modifying our understanding of physics and gravity are wrong. They could be right. But when we look at all the available evidence, all of it, not just galaxy scale physics, but all scale physics, dark matter has a much easier time explaining all our observations. Yes, it has its weaknesses. Yes, we haven't seen it. I get it. I am perfectly willing for dark matter to be wrong. I don't get up every morning ready to like go down, die on that dark matter hill every single day. No, it's an interesting hypothesis. It's the best answer we have because it explains all the available data, but it could be wrong. Tevis could be right, Mond could be right, but it has a much more difficult time. Yes, you can make little adjustments to Tevis or Mond and able to explain the bullet cluster, but once you do that, you have a hard time explaining uh, galaxy cluster motions in general. And then if you tune it to galaxy cluster motions, you have a hard time explaining cosmic microwave background. And then if you go after the cosmic microwave background, uh, you don't get the right structure formation at the end of it. It's like you're constantly playing whack-a-mole with Tevis and Mond. But with dark matter, despite its weaknesses, overall on balance has a much stronger ability and simpler ability to explain all the evidence. That's why it persists today. And that's why whenever you hear someone say that they have a better idea than dark matter, that they have an alternative to dark matter, that's great. Do your homework. If you have a better idea than dark matter, that's great. Explain all the evidence. If they are just, uh, trust me, and I've read a lot of papers on this, if your alternative to dark matter, if you see an alternative to dark matter that is only focusing on galaxy rotation curves, that is a tiny percent of the problem. Even if galaxy rotation curves never existed, we would still have evidence for dark matter. So any replacement for dark matter can't just solve one of the problems, it has to solve all of the problems. 
And that's a tall order, which is why dark matter has persisted as a viable hypothesis for almost 50 years even though we haven't directly observed it. I hope we find it soon. If we don't, we may need to start investigating some new options or take some alternatives more seriously. I'm fine with that. That's how science progresses. But in the meantime, dark matter is our best bet. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Please like, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.